Hey, it's me, the mouth of the sound, Jimmy Hart. Hey, check out my new tag team, baby, Monty and the Frow. Hey, Jimmy, don't forget to tell them about Long Island's number one pro wrestling broadcast. Well, you know what I would, but you already did it. It's Monty and the Pharaoh. With Monty and Pharaoh. The Monty and Pharaoh show. Monty and Pharaoh, bro. Monty and the Pharaoh. Monty and the Pharaoh. The Monty and the Pharaoh. The Monty and Pharaoh show. And you're watching the Monty and Pharaoh show. Monty and the Pharaoh. With Monty and the Pharaoh. Monty and the Pharaoh. It's Monty and the Pharaoh. With Monty and the Pharaoh. Monty and the Pharaoh. Monty and the Pharaoh. Monty and the Pharaoh. Monty and Pharaoh. Monty and Pharaoh. Monty and the Pharaoh. And Monty and the Pharaoh. Oh, is it Monty and the Pharaoh? Yeah. Monty and Pharaoh. Dad. The Monty and the Pharaoh show. The Monty and the Pharaoh. To the Monty and the Pharaoh show. And it's Monty and the Pharaoh, baby. Watching Monty and the Pharaoh. With Monty and the Pharaoh. Monty and the Pharaoh. Oh. What a run! Monty and the Pharaoh. Monty and the Pharaoh. Hey, cut music. When you want the best in professional wrestling, Long Island, there's only one place you're gonna get it right here. Monty and the Pharaoh. <laughs> now that's not just the coolest, and that's not just the best. That, my friends, is just <laughs> incredible. <laughs> Monty and the Pharaoh. You've got the future Hall of Famer, that rocker, Marty Gennetti, and MJ in the house, and I'm sitting here with two more future Hall of Famers, Monty and the Pharaoh. We're doing that stuff, and we're going to rock it. Monty and the Pharaoh. Monty and the Pharaoh. Duh. Shot a video, and I did a little of, you know, I can't smile without you. Can't oh, smile without you. You're going to make me cry. Yeah. Stop. No, well, you see, I, I also rap it, yo. Like, I can't laugh and I can't sing. I'm don't, fine when I'm like, that. it's hard to do anything. That'll make me cry, All too. Right. <laughs> Welcome to Long Island's number one pro wrestling broadcast out of Indie Music TV in Ron Konkama, Long Island. Mr. Bill Apter, thank you for joining Monty and the Pharaoh. How are you, sir? It is my extreme pleasure to be here. And you called me an, an, an icon, but the, and I really appreciate that. I'm very flattered, but all my years shooting pictures at the, of the matches, it was a Nikon. Not an icon. Uh, you were talking about um, uh, Animal, yeah. Joe Laurinaitis. And it's funny because I, I mentioned this recently to a lot of people. Uh, I shot this photo that's on this uh, sweatshirt along with Craig Peters. We did some horror lighting, et cetera. And uh, uh, the Road Warriors asked permission to make this into a sweatshirt. And I've had this sweatshirt here for a long time. And I wanted to pay homage tonight to both of them. Um, I, it's really funny because as much as I knew Joe, I rarely, and I knew him from the day that, uh, Ole Anderson put him in a, uh, uh, a biker outfit, called him animal. And I never called him Joe. Even when I saw him personally, we go out to dinner and do things, photo sessions, interviews. He was always animal to me. And Mike was always Hawk to me. I always, always call them by their, their character names. But we, with the loss of him, it was so shocking. I got a, uh, a call at about a quarter to seven in the morning, Eastern time from uh, Sal Corrente. Uh, he's the guy who invented Wrestle Reunion. Uh, he was known as the Big Cheese and he's still around the business. And he said, Joe died. And I said, Joe who? And he said, animal. I was like, the whole day yesterday, during the day I work for a nonprofit company, beside doing the wrestling full time, I help people with disabilities to find jobs. I couldn't go out and do anything yesterday. My body and my mind were obliterated by that news. I had just sent a video 
to his lovely wife, Kim, for his 60th birthday. She was kind of getting videos from everybody, and she included me mm. on that. Mm. And uh, she said he loved it because what I did, I said, who's, the, who's this video for? Oh, oh, Joe, the guy with the makeup, oh, the demolition guy, right? She <laughs> said he roared at that. He thought it was the funniest thing he'd ever heard. And he celebrated that, and then I wished them happy anniversary on their Facebook page. And then that next morning, the call from Sal, and my phone just blew up the whole day. And uh, I'm still pretty much in a state of shock over this whole thing, because sometimes you expect these things, but this makes the year 2020 suck even more. The recent deaths of uh, the, my best friend in the business, uh, Mr. Wrestling Number 2. Mm. Uh, you can see his mask right above me next to that uh, belt that some fan made for me out of Legos. Um, death of Bruno San Martino, uh, Pedro Morales, all these people whose careers I, along with the rest of the team at the magazines, chronicled and brought it to you pre-internet. Uh, it's very, very very difficult. I just, uh, it's very hard to deal with. It's losing family. The other side of that is the great stuff that he brought to all of us, that he and Hawk did. They were the best kick-ass team. I used to think that the Andersons, Ole and Gene, mm. were the toughest team in wrestling till I saw the Road Warriors. And I saw one of their first matches before the makeup, uh, and they were kicking the crap out of of uh, uh, who was it? Uh, David San Martino and uh, Roberto Soto, I think it was. <laughs> and I was shooting right this close, and I was going like, "They're not. These guys aren't pulling anything." And little by little, the way uh, I became friends with them and Precious Paul Ellering, and then the photo shoots that Craig Peters and I would do, and the the interviews on uh, uh, the Crockett shows and World Championship Wrestling, where we just had fun improv with each other, um, they brought a whole new, like ECW changed the business forever, they changed the business forever. Uh, all right, ladies and gentlemen, let's get to the juice. No, wait, 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 I have to tell you the terrible joke now. The Go terrible ahead. joke? Go ahead. These, yes, these two men were outside a Chinese restaurant wanting to know if there are any Chinese Jews. So they said, why don't we go in and we'll ask the waiter? So they sit down, they ask the waiter, are there Chinese Jews? Waiter said, I don't know, I'll go ask the boss. He comes back, he says, the boss says there's no Chinese Jews, only orange juice, tomato juice, and pineapple juice. <laughs> Very <laughs> good. <laughs> you brought up the long stuff, so oh, you... Lord. All right. You had to call my segment the juice, huh, Mike? You there you go. To, there well, you go. I'm going to tell you the truth. I never wrote anyone but me. Okay. I never go to wrote anyone... I was never any of the other characters mm -hmm. or anything. And there are two people that worked for us that people don't believe that they were real. One of them was Dan Shockett. He was our first heel reporter. Yes. Dan died yes. at a very young age of cancer. Dan was a Long Island kid, too. He was from uh, Oceanside. Um, and Eddie Elner, who is still alive, and you can find him on uh, Facebook. He took Dan's place after Dan's passing. For those folks who don't know, Matt Brock was an imaginary. Uh, I thought he was a real person. It turns out he wasn't. How do you know he was imaginary? I was. That's that's the wild rumor I heard that he wasn't a real person. Well, it might be a rumor. I, I mean, unless, uh, unless you he's can. Got me. Unless you can <laughs> he's got me. He's got me. Listen, this is torturing me. You're gonna leave me hanging like this? <laughs> All these years, I thought Matt Brock was a real drunk. <laughs> Give up. Oh, this is terrible. In, in your book, Is Wrestling Fixed? I didn't know it was broken. There's a picture of you and your brother. So, obviously, two wrestling yeah. fans want to be yeah. tag team champions. What did, yeah. your dad, what did your dad think about the whole deal? <laughs> My dad would back anything that I wanted to do. My dad was a letter carrier at the New York uh, City Post Office uh, down in the Garment District. My dad was a Sandlot umpire. When I started getting into the business, my dad came with me because he was very proud of what I was becoming, and they let him come in with me. And my dad actually became very good friends. Pedro Morales um, used to call us 
maybe once or twice a month, he'd say, baby, I'd like to talk to daddy. And he would call and talk to my father all the time. My dad and my mother both were so proud of that I was getting into something that I was following for so many years uh, as a kid. No, it was, yeah, my, my dad loved it. My dad, when they moved out, when my parents moved down to Florida to retire in West Palm Beach, I set my dad up with uh, uh, the Florida promotion through Eddie Graham to make sure my father sat at the timekeeper's table in West Palm Beach every Monday. And every Monday he would call me with wrestlers on the phone. All the wrestlers, they'd see me at the garden the next month. Hey, Bill, we saw your dad. Uh, it was great. It was wonderful. How hard yeah. was it to get the wrestlers to accept you in the beginning? Was it something you had to sell to them, or was it they just realized that you were making them bigger, bigger than life? Great question. Um, it was difficult at the very beginning because there were a lot of stories that Mr. Weston fabricated. For example, like a life story of Bruno San Martino. And when I first met Bruno, Bruno said to me, this story you had there about my sister, like killing a Nazi when she was, and he was very, he was very, he was very upset. And then Gorilla Monsoon, who was a main person backstage, told me that he allowed one of Mr. Weston's photographers to come into his house and take pictures. And there was a, a leech shot in the um, story of Monsoon with a gun saying he wanted to shoot Bruno San Martino. Well, the San Martinos and the Monsoon family were very close friends, and Monsoon was furious. So Vince McMahon Sr. found out that I was coming in to do some stuff, not for the magazines. When I first started, I was doing a radio show in New York, WHBI 105.9 FM, and I bought time. And I did interviews, but when I started with the magazine, they found out I was working for Stanley Weston. Vince Sr. told me he and Stanley had some issues, but if I can prove myself and do what's right, uh, he would let me into the show. So I did the very first magazine shoot interview with Bruno San Martino. Uh, and at that point, Bruno endorsed me. And then the people that Mr. Weston was friends with, like Sam Muchnick, uh, Al Costello from the original Fabulous Kangaroos, mm -hmm. they started inviting me down to shows, uh, and they never told me there were going to be title changes at that point, but they would bring me down there, and all of a sudden, a title would change when I'm shooting pictures there, so I happened to be at the right place at the right time. Yeah, so he endorsed, Mr. Weston endorsed me to a lot of people, but little by little, I got the endorsements of, of the people in the dressing rooms, and then I became you know, second nature to me being back there. I was expected back there. How different was it for you covering boxing compared to wrestling? Totally different because with wrestling, you can, that, what a great question. Um, with, uh, with wrestling, you can shoot various matches of people and almost anticipate after years of shooting it, what's going to happen with boxing. You only have one chance of it, of it. I shot many uh, Muhammad Ali fights. Anyway, your speed, I like your style, but your pace so cheap, I won't be back for a while. But anyway, <laughs> you got great speed, you got endurance. If you sign to fight me, increase your insurance. But, um, <laughs> but, and, but shooting fights, you had one chance to get that one picture. And back in the days of shooting film, not digitally, uh, sometimes I'd shoot if a fight was 15 rounds, I'd do two rolls of film, changing film in the middle of a, a three-minute round and just getting a million pictures, and sometimes maybe five of them would be used. Do, you, do you think hold the on, internet... Hold on, oh, hold, go on. Ahead. Wait, hold on a sec. Hold on. Matt, Matt, I'll be up in about 45 minutes. Matt Brock's call. I'll be up in about... I'm on the show right now. <laughs> Matt Brock? Yeah. Okay. He's calling in? All right. Yeah. Okay, I'll, I'm busy. He's okay. real. I'm sorry. He's real. So he is real. Is he drinking? Oh, never mind. Yeah. Now, you've obviously worked with the greatest promoters ever, Vince McMahon, Vern Gagne, Crockett, et cetera, et cetera. Could you compare a few of them for us, you know, like the difference between a Vince or a Vern? Well, uh, the Vern was very secretive. Vern knew that I knew the business, but I'd ask him a question about the business, and he'd go, oh, I don't know. I just have to go ask my son. Call Greg. And then Greg would tell me whatever I needed to know. Vince Sr. was a businessman. I never really asked him what was going to happen or what was going to go on. He was very nice to me, very businesslike. 
Jim Crockett was, uh, he became a good friend. Uh, we became confidants of each other. And when the WWF banned all the, uh, the wrestling magazines from uh, their buildings, because they had their own magazine, Jim Crockett uh, said, hey, I'll help you guys out. I'll put you on my TV every week. And every week, I was almost every week, I was on his uh, TBS show doing uh, Pro Wrestling Illustrated scouting reports. Yes. Do you remember those? Yes, mm-hmm. we do. Yeah. Bill, yeah, how affected yeah. were the sales of PWI when Vince launched the WWF magazine, which, by the way, I thought absolutely sucked compared to yours? Go on. Well, thank you. But uh, not at all. It didn't hurt us at all. Um, we, uh, we sent people. Um, we bought pictures from press people. We sent people uh, in the stands with long lenses. And we weren't, you know, it's funny because we weren't selling posters in the magazines or anything. We were reporting news. Mm-hmm. And this is why I think nothing legally was ever challenged because we were covering wrestling like Sports Illustrated would cover football or baseball or boxing or whatever. How, did you ever get angry about it? And did you guys meet and say, you know what? We're just not even going to cover the WWE. We took world title recognition away from them for many, many years. Mm. Um, but it didn't really affect anything. You know, it was controversial. Fans wrote in back then that we were wrong. Some fans supported it. It just, it, we, we made it more like a regional promotion. And we made like the NWA was a worldwide promotion. Yeah. We did the rankings uh, for each of those magazines because every week I was on the phone regularly with every wrestling office finding out what they were doing. I remember there was a three month lag time from yes. the time we. Yes. Put the magazine to bed for the time it hit the street. Correct. A lot of things changed. Yeah. Andy Kaufman, and I want you to take the story, but I'm just going to lead you into it. Andy Kaufman comes to you and says, hey, I want to get into wrestling females or wrestling in general. And you reach out to Vince Sr. Um, how come Sr. didn't want to go with the angle? Well, first of all, let me, let me explain to you what had happened. Andy was already... Um, wrestling women in his act Mm -hmm. there in his nightclub act and his stage show Um, we were backstage at Madison Square Garden one night and I had never met him and he came over to me and he said oh you're Bill Apter I read your magazine we got we got to be friends and then he told me that he spoke to Vince McMahon and uh, uh, Vince didn't want any uh, uh, any showbiz people they wanted to keep his wrestling away from showbiz people, just wrestling to be pro wrestling. Even though Vince Jr. at one point uh, had Andy down at uh, ringside to do some promotional work. So he said to me, what are you doing after the matches? And I said, I'm going back to my apartment in Queens. He said, well, how do you get there? Now, keep in mind, he was one of the stars of Taxi, one of the most top-rated comedy shows of all time. He was a major star. Yes. Of taxi. Alaska. He said, how do you get home? I said, I take the E-train. He said, can I go with you? I said, sure. So here I am with Andy Kaufman on the train and go up to my apartment in, in Briarwood, Queens. And I was living with a, uh, uh, a wonderful girl wrestler by the name of Susan Sexton, uh, the Australian champion. And we walk in and every other word out of her mouth was the F-bomb. She says, I... Hey, mate. Oh, F and Andy Kaufman, how you doing? So we, sat for hours. we sat for hours talking about how he wanted to be Buddy Rogers or Fred Blassie. And after about an hour and a half, Suzanne just said, I can't listen to this crap anymore. And she went in the bedroom, put on her headphones, the Ramones, gabba, gabba, hey, hey, and it was just gone for the night. So I said to Andy, I said, you know, I have a friend in Memphis, Tennessee, Jerry Lawley. He says, oh, yeah, I've seen him in the magazine. I said, they're way ahead of the curve here. They have characters like Frankenstein, mm. the Wolfman. You're Elvis. Imitate. You go over great there. Why don't we call him? He says, well, it's 1 o'clock in the morning. I said, He's, we're wrestling people. We call all night. So he called Jerry Lawler, and he says, you got Andy Kaufman, the guy from Taxi, in your roach-infested apartment in, in Briarwood. <laughs> I said, yeah. And I put him on the phone, and 
as the cliche goes, the rest is history. And that's what put the key in the ignition. And a few days later, Andy was down in, uh, in Memphis and uh, Jerry Lawler and Jerry Jarrett brilliantly set up that entire situation. If Senior had gone for the idea, how do you think it would have worked out? And was there an argument between Junior and Senior? Because I could see Junior wanting this right away. I, I, I don't know, but I do know that Junior did tell. Uh, by the way, I just noticed something that my stool is blocking the aftertaste. My stool, right? You said okay. you said stool. I did. I Which said stool was blocking the aftertaste. Is it this <laughs> one head here? My stool. Um, oh, that kind of stool. I'm sorry. Oh, right. okay. But but Vince Vince Junior Vince Junior did tell Jerry Lawler at one point that that's the one thing that escaped him that he would have loved to have done. And back when they opened the Performance Center, I was talking with Triple H and Stephanie, who were two of the nicest and most gracious people I have ever met in my whole life, in or outside of the business. And neither of them, somehow, we were just talking about wrestling stories, and neither of them knew that, that they were like, you're the one? Yeah. There are a lot of people who don't know that. That's why mm. well, before I go on any show, and you know I did this with your show too, I said, you got to read my book because eight out of nine of the podcasts and shows that I did when my book first came, and I mentioned they were like, really? You guys knew it. So, Does WrestleMania even happen without the kaufman Lawler thing? Because to me, the kaufman Lawler thing could very well be the beginning of the E in entertainment. Yes, sports. You know, first of all, thank you for saying Kaufman, because everybody I meet outside of New York goes, oh, you're the guy that set up Andy Kaufman, huh? <laughs> <laughs> New Yorker. Say it like a New Yorker. Uh, that, was, that was the first shot of sports entertainment. At what point in your career were you smartened up to the business between kayfabe and the work? Hmm. It's very hard to say because when I was a fan, it was all real as far as I was concerned. I think when I was in the hallways and just heard the guys kind of talking about their matches and stuff, uh, nobody ever took me aside to smart me up except one guy in Boston, and he tragically died in a uh, plane crash, Bobby Shane. I was at the Boston Garden, and he and I went to – dinner afterwards at an Italian restaurant called Paul Carey's, and we were talking about something, and he said, well, yeah, you're only as good as your opponent. It takes two to tango. You can't do well in that ring unless you have someone to do it with. And little by little, I never asked anybody. Uh, I just, little by little, I just kind of picked it up myself, but I never let anybody, I never brought that up or anything backstage. I always played backstage like what was going on was sports when i i have hundreds of interviews back from the 70s still on the cassette and a lot of them digital which i i run periodically on one wrestling video.com and all the interviews are done in character because i covered pro wrestling like it was a sport so i didn't look at it like it was uh, a work so to say so i kind of knew it but I didn't ask anybody about it. And sometimes wrestlers would just kind of tell me what was going to happen. Most guys uh, wanted to be in the magazines. Most guys appreciated that I uh, would approach them to be in the magazines. Sometimes because of their schedules, guys would not show up and not call. And then a week later, uh, oh, crap, I was on the road. It's, it's, it was part of the business. But no, nobody, nobody really uh, ever stood me up for long periods of time. How about your relationship with the Von Erichs? Can you fill us in a little bit about the uh, great Von Erichs? Oh, man, I, I became a member of the Von Erichs from, uh, from what they, uh, you know, David was my, was one of my best friends. Um, Kerry came to my house several times. Um, I still talk to Kevin once or twice a year. He's living in Hawaii. Um, there's a chapter in the book where Fritz wanted to, practically kill me. Hmm. Um, Dan Shockett had written a column. Uh, he was our bad guy reporter. He had written a column uh, likening uh, Kevin, David, and Kerry to the Three Stooges. And David 
had died when that magazine came out. So there was no explain. So Gary Hart, who was one of the bookers there, called me and he says, my man, Fritz does not want you anywhere. He's very, you're out of the family. And I went anyway, because I needed to talk to him. Uh, it turns out that his wife calmed him down. Doris uh, Atkinson uh, calmed him down and uh, I made peace with him. But I was very close with all of the Von Erichs. His, uh, Kevin's sons call me Uncle Bill. David was actually the first death that I really encountered in the wrestling business of a young person who had so much promise. And Kerry, I was so close to Kerry. I mean, I, I, I'd talk with him once or twice a week on the phone. He was a wrestling fan as well. And yeah, I have somewhere in my archives, I have a video of him sitting on the couch in my old apartment at the Cameo Townhouses in Massapequa Park. Uh, my kids weren't home and he told them, he said, this is uh, Uncle Kerry and you know, don't take drugs and don't do this and do that and go to school and get good marks. And I still have that somewhere here. Mm. Let me ask you, if you look back on your life now, Bill, do you, do you find yourself totally blessed or would you maybe have done something different? No, I never would have done anything differently. I was offered a job uh, by WWE to be editor of their magazine, but I was very loyal to uh, Stanley Weston, the person who hired me. Uh, no, I, want, I started out wanting to be a broadcaster in pro wrestling, and uh, the, 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 the companies were all filled doing that. I wanted to be on TV and wrestling, and through the magazines, I remember Mr. Weston saying to me, you want to be on TV and on the radio? I can help you do that. And he started sending me on these trips to Detroit and Toronto and uh, Florida and Georgia and all that. And me being down there with a sport jacket and a tie and a nice shirt made it feel like this guy came all the way from New York City to be here. So this must be even more important than you think as a fan watching it. Nice. And I shot a video and I did a little of you know, I can't smile without you. Can't no, smile without you. You're going to make me cry. Yeah. Stop. No, well, you see, I, I also rap it. Yo, like I can't laugh and I can't sing. I'm don't, smiling don't and like that. it's hard to do anything. That'll make me cry All too. Right. <laughs> but, uh, but we'll see you eventually at the matches.